Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week where we're talking about all of the major hardware news for the past seven days or so. Intel has announced that it is delaying its 7 nanometer process further still, which is a big hit for the company and its prospects on the stock market, but also in technology. NVIDIA is working on Ampere scheduling, uh, AMD confirming once again Zen 3 and its intent to arrive this year, and plenty of other news like Cooler Master crowdsourcing the funding for a Raspberry Pi case. Before that, this video is brought to you by us and our brand new Gamers Nexus wireframe mouse mat. Aside from being the best way to directly support our long form investigative reporting, you can also get a custom made high quality mouse mat made with a high detail 3D design that we created to show off heat sinks, coolers, video cards, and more. The mouse mat uses a stitched blue border for added longevity, a blue rubber underside for unique flair, and a microfiber cloth for smooth tracking. The mat is 36 inches by 12 inches and fits a keyboard and mouse easily. We sold out of the first run in 48 hours, but have more getting made right now. To backorder your mouse mat and ensure you get one in the next run, go to store.gamersnexus.net and backorder yours while reducing our reliance on advertisers, or click the link in the description below. Getting straight into it this week, things seemed like they couldn't get much worse on the manufacturing side for Intel. Intel has struggled with 10 nanometer process for a number of years now, somewhere around 2015 that we started really talking about 10 nanometer for Intel. So it's been a while. Seven is also getting a delay according to recent updates from Intel CEO Bob Swan. And this is on the back of Intel stretching out 14 nanometer as far as it possibly can. And to Intel's credit, it's genuinely impressive how far the company has gotten Skylake and its subsequent Skylakes. Uh, because if you look at the 10600K, the 10900K, they're pretty competitive, but uh, as you also look at AMD's Ryzen CPUs, especially in the 3000 series, it's clear that the gap is starting to narrow. And although today we can still pretty easily recommend something like a 10600K for a lot of gaming builds or mid-range builds, as AMD chips away more and more of the market, especially at the lower end and especially in production and workstation applications, uh, Intel is losing ground and it's got less it can stand on with each passing update from AMD. So Intel really needs to get moving on the manufacturing side because it's it can't make 14 nanometer last forever. So anyway, if things couldn't get worse, it did announce the delay to 7 nanometer. Uh, that means that volume production, according to Intel, is unlikely to come online until 2022 or possibly 2023, as opposed to the original potential target of late 2021. Intel CEO Bob Swan and man who hates benchmarking uh, delivered the disheartening news along with Intel's quarter two earnings while also touching on a few other technology points. According to Swan, Intel is, quote, seeing an approximate six month shift in our seven nanometer based CPU product timing relative to prior expectations. And furthermore, Intel noted in the discussion that seven nanometer yields are approximately 12 months behind the internal target goals. Quote, we have identified a defect mode in our 7 nanometer process that resulted in yield degradation. We've root caused the issue and believe there are no fundamental roadblocks, but we have also invested in contingency plans to hedge against further schedule uncertainty, Swan said. In order to maintain Intel's roadmap and competitiveness, Swan said that Intel will lean on other aspects, such as die disaggregation and advanced packaging. Part of Intel's contingency plans would see Intel leveraging internal and external process technologies alike. So uh, this would mean that Intel would be leaning on potentially third-party foundries where it might make sense. Intel's already started doing this in the last couple of years, where when it had severe 14 nanometer shortages, it started moving back to older process technologies for chipsets so that it can free up some of the lines, some of the fab space for CPUs. So this has already kind of started, but that is one of the backup plans if there are continual issues with 7 nanometer. Uh, as such, Intel is now stating that Ponte Vecchio, which is uh, one of the upcoming architectures that we've been talking about, especially on the GPU side, uh, will combine both internal and external process technologies and that would be combined with Intel's packaging technology. That's supposed to ship in late 2021 or early 2022 at this point. Intel's historic trouble at 10 nanometer also led it to uh, decouple its architecture advancements from its process node advancements, and thus Sunny Cove was born. This allows Intel to move forward with architectural improvements without handing them on a smaller process in the event of a roadblock. This is something we covered several years ago at this point at a uh, 
an event that Intel hosted talking about its 3D approach, as they called it, to multiple dyes and process technologies on a single package. So this is a disaggregated approach that makes Intel's architectures more portable between nodes and means Intel could backport a newer architecture to an older process technology, in theory. Intel claims it's still committed to its roadmap and annual product improvement cadence, and also states that, quote, while process technology is very important, it is only one of the six technology pillars of innovation that drive differentiation in our products. We should note, too, here that pillars are the absolute peak way, the pinnacle of how CEOs compare their companies against each other, because benchmarks are bad. So uh, back a couple of years ago, AMD on the GPU side with Raja Kadori announced that it had a five-pillar approach to manufacturing and products. Intel has a six-pillar approach. Uh, six is one more than five, and so that means it's better. So Intel is better than AMD because it has six. There's no way to cut this where it doesn't stain at this point, especially when AMD is executing aggressively on its own roadmap and products and is able to leverage partnerships with TSMC rather than having to figure out how to make its own foundries work. Intel is promising more updates at its upcoming architecture day, so stay tuned for that. Next up, this one is a bit of a leak to GN. So we've confirmed at this point with board partners that NVIDIA is working on its Amper launch scheduling and timelines starting the week of the 26th of July, that is. So this isn't major news. It's just kind of typically would be considered boring scheduling stuff, but NVIDIA Amper has been big lately. So they're basically about a week from time of filming, but they're going to be working on the plans for the rollout dates, the launch timing, and things like that for NVIDIA's next generation of products. This typically means that you're getting close to the end. And from what we understand right now, based on most of the discussion online and in discussion with board partners, it sounds like NVIDIA's target is still somewhere in the September range. This is a date that Igor from Igor's lab actually predicted quite a while ago as well. So uh, definitely a shout out to him for kind of nailing it on that one. We don't know yet if it's going to be a September launch. Things could change. Look at Intel as an example of how they do. Uh, but that's what it looks like right now. So that's the news we have on that. Uh, we, I guess the biggest thing to mention here, other than the fact that NVIDIA is talking about the launch scheduling and timing next week, the biggest thing to talk about is how all of this happened. This is the earliest that NVIDIA has had a leak in as long as I personally can remember working in the industry. And NVIDIA is also, if you're not aware, one of the, the most extreme companies and kind of vindictive specifically when it comes to leaks and the people who do it. So the fact that this is getting out there, everything like the, the shroud images, the card designs, some of the spec and bench numbers you're seeing out there in leaks and rumors, the fact that all that's getting out this far in advance of, of launch definitely is bothering NVIDIA, or at least NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huan. And to give you an idea, NVIDIA often decides things like pricing for the product literally minutes before going on stage and announcing a press. So that's how they, they at least always keep that close to the leather jacket, because when announcing the products, you normally don't actually see the pricing in those rumors, because uh, it's decided last minute a lot of times. So anyway, definitely bothering NVIDIA. but. That's what it looks like for the timing. We'll obviously stay close to this one and cover it as soon as it gets closer to launch. Uh, AMD confirming once again that Zen 3 is coming this year. AMD previously put out a note to press that Zen 3 was still on target for 2020 after some rumors previously that it was being pushed back to 2021. So that was an official confirmation from the company. And now they are, AMD is confirming that again. So in a perfect world, AMD probably was targeting Computex for launch. It usually has pushed its processors around Computex for the last couple of years, but we're living in a world with human malware that has sidelined every trade show for the year. So for the last several months, AMD has been confirming and reconfirming again that we'll see Zen 3 soon. And to drive this point home once again, AMD's Rick Bergman, Executive Vice President of Computing and Graphics, took to AMD's blog to post some updates. The blog post mostly centered on AMD's newest 7 nanometer Ryzen 4000 series APUs, which we just discussed. However, towards the end of the blog post, Bergman concluded with, quote, so what's next for AMD in the PC space? Well, I can't share too much, but I can say our high performance journey continues with our first Zen 3 client processor on track to launch later this year. I will wrap by saying you haven't seen the best of us yet. A couple things here. We already know from the Ryzen 4000 APU discussion, the news video we ran previously, that AMD is working on a desktop APU in, well, they're both, they're technically desktop, but they're OEM only. So AMD is working on a DIY PC APU to come out 
uh, in the 4000 series as well. So what's been announced so far isn't the only stuff that's coming out. And we don't know if exactly those SKUs are coming over later or if it's going to be a different name. But that was already on the, on the plans and we already knew about it. So what Bergman is saying here, specifically he uses the word client, meaning that we're going to get more of Zen 3 than just Epic, for example. So there should be a PC DIY part. The client side of Zen 3 still encompasses desktop and mobile. So we'll have to speculate a little bit on what the future looks like, but uh, that's the news so far from AMD official. Next up, Samsung is also struggling with poor yield on its five nanometer node. So Intel is not the only one dealing with shrinking process nodes this week, it seems. A report out of Digitime suggests that Samsung is currently high centered on its own nanometer hurdle. This one sized at five nanometers. Samsung's five nanometer process will rely on EUV for critical layers, and the high volume production was slated for end of quarter two this year. However, according to Seeking Alpha, Samsung wasn't able to get EUV equipment from ASML installed until end of June, which already puts Samsung's timetable in jeopardy. Further complicating this is the reportedly poor yields that Samsung has seen, which Digitimes claims Samsung is struggling to improve. As such, it's being reported that this not only affects Samsung's own chips and product line production, but possibly Qualcomm's as well. Samsung's first five nanometer chip was allegedly meant to be its own Exynos 992 SoC. However, upcoming Samsung products are rumored to be using the older Exynos 990 instead. As for Qualcomm, its upcoming Snapdragon 875G SoC and Snapdragon X60 5G modem could be delayed as well, as they may very well be caught in the crosshairs of Samsung's manufacturing woes. In a chip deal to end all chip deals, there's also been news this week that it seems a possible sale of ARM has courted the attention of NVIDIA. This, in, uh, in, in other words, no kidding. ARM was in the news last week when we were talking about how Apple is moving towards its own production as quickly as it can in both CPU and GPUs, but especially on the CPU side, and uh, ARM is involved in a lot of that. So a couple of points to note here. An acquisition of ARM by NVIDIA would have huge implications for the CPU market and would undoubtedly attract the gaze of regulators. ARM is currently owned by SoftBank, a holding company conglomerate that has stakes in a slew of technology companies and formerly owned a chunk of NVIDIA. SoftBank acquired ARM in 2016 for $32 billion, but recent reports have been suggesting that SoftBank may be ready to list the company for sale. And the uh, two separate reports that have come from Bloomberg mentioned NVIDIA as a potential buyer as one, with the other report mentioning that Apple is, is apparently not interested. Apple buying ARM would be a potential major conflict of interest and likely wouldn't sit well with regulators at all, being that NVIDIA doesn't really have a horse in the SOC race in any major way, it may stand a better chance of getting a deal approved. But it would still have to be approved, and that's a big maybe at this point. Reports have also been suggesting that SoftBank may pursue an IPO for ARM instead, and it's also possible that SoftBank is simply gauging interest and may end up doing nothing with it. They might just stick with it for now. Next up, AMD stock is currently enjoying a 15-year high, and as Tom's Hardware points out, for the first time since 2006, AMD's stock price has topped Intel's, although you get into funny stock market math if you start doing that comparison. But either way, AMD's stock price has been on the rise for months now, and starting in 2020, it's been breaking its own price records. Uh, it has reached a 30% improvement year over year, according to MarketWatch, and Intel stock has been more tumultuous at this point, especially with the news reported earlier in this very video. So Intel stock price took a nosedive following that. Uh, stock markets are kind of silly things and don't behave rationally, so uh, this is, is probably expected, but it took a nosedive, and now we'll see what happens next. People might bump the price by buying in because they think it went too low. But either way, it took a dive following the seven nanometer portfolio delay statements. Uh, Intel has only seen a 1% improvement year over year. It's a company with an awful lot of money and a lot of different segments. So it's also harder to move the needle for it. But uh, either way, Intel's more or less been uh, stagnant at this point. So it seems that part of AMD's surge in stock price is coming at the expense of Intel setbacks. And this is in addition, of course, to AMD executing actually pretty well on its own roadmap and product release cadence for the last couple of years. AMD's stock is currently sitting at $68.48. Intel has tumbled down to $50.67. And uh, I, I'm not much of a stock market person. That's why I work in computer hardware and reviewing it. But uh, my understanding is that the two aren't necessarily directly comparable, depending on the, the way that the shares have been divided. But either way, Intel's taken a dive. 
we'll see what that means later on and, uh, and how Intel tries to bounce back. Last up, Cooler Master's Pi Case 40. Uh, Cooler Master is currently, uh, I'll mention this too, if you're like a stock trader or something in any serious sense, feel free to post the comments uh, talking about this stuff below so that we can kind of gauge the opinions of the community. Uh, anyway, Cooler Master is currently crowdfunding a case for the Raspberry Pi 4. And it's doing so through Kickstarter, which is interesting because Cooler Master is one of the biggest companies in the space, at least in the cooler and case market and power supplies. And it, it makes the stock coolers for AMD, stock coolers for Intel. It makes coolers for NVIDIA. It's a big company, but they still needed to ask for some money to kickstart a case, apparently. So this is maybe a new venture for the company that could potentially spawn some follow-up products, depending on the interest. The case is known as the Pi Case 40, and it is attempting to differentiate itself from other Pi cases on the market in a few different ways. For starters, Cooler Master claims that the case will passively cool a Raspberry Pi 4, and says that it would work for cooling even for one that's been heavily overclocked. The Pi Case 40 will feature a cast aluminum body acting as the heat sink with added fins along the block for additional heat soaking. Secondly, the Pi Case 40 never needs to be removed as the case will allow access to all of the I.O. on the board, even the 40 pin GPIO headers, and as the case redirects those to the other side for access. The Pi Case 40 also features a power button to turn the Pi on or off without having to remove the power source. The power button is also remappable, so it can be configured for a number of other functions like scripts, overclocking, or opening applications. The Pi Case 40 will also include a set of VESA mounts, which should make it easy to mount behind a display or on the wall. And Cooler Master further claims that the Pi Case 40 is an open source project. It says it's using Kickstarter as a means to receive community feedback presumably in the form of money to some extent, but feedback nonetheless. Additionally, Cooler Master will make the schematics and the 3D model for the Pi Case 40 available uh, for free via its website, which is actually somewhat admirable, so we, we like hearing that. And currently, the Pi Case 40 is expected to ship as early as September. You can pre-order it through Kickstarter for $25. Uh, I'm not really sure if we're going to look at it. We'd obviously generally advise waiting and seeing how it turns out, but. Who knows? Maybe we'll have a project we can throw at it or something. That's it for this one, though. As always, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to get some behind-the-scenes videos. And subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.